Uh, my wife, Elizabeth Page Henry. Hi. Hi. Hey, what do you do, Stan? I'm an FBI agent. <laughs> this scene is very realistic. Hello, uh, my name is Jack Barsky. I uh, spied on behalf of the KGB for 10 years, 1978 to 1988, and in 2014, I became a US citizen. Today, I'm gonna play a movie critic based on my experience, my actual experience in espionage. This is something that could have happened in real life, how you clear a dead drop. Those kinds of false coins existed. The, the way he then opens the coin by using tools that are readily available. And the, the fact that there was a little piece of paper with some information on it, it's quite realistic because, you know, I, I got bits and pieces of information uh, through uh, shortwave radio and I transmitted information in a uh, film cartridge uh, where I photographed uh, stuff that I wrote down on, on paper. Uh, I would occasionally wander around in a park and, uh, oh boy, I've, here's an oil can. It was a crushed oil can. I, uh, I take that, take it home and then use some pliers and screwdrivers to open this thing up. And voila, there was a passport and money in there. I know the story quite well. Abel was considered a hero in the KGB while I was in training. I don't know if he was still alive when I was in Moscow. It has been documented from both sides with a lot of exaggeration. Both the Americans and the Soviets played up his worth, what he actually did and what he accomplished, what happens in situations like that. Uh, you, can, you can use uh, agents <clears throat> once they're caught for propaganda services. I doubt that the FBI stormed his apartment the way that they did. That looks unprofessional. Why are you running? What you do, you if you want to search somebody's apartment, you wait until they're out and then they do, you do that in secret. That's the way my house was searched while I was on vacation. The FBI made a mistake once they're in there to allow able to touch anything. I would give it uh, probably an eight. Does this service to the professionalism of the FBI? Everything else is really very realistic. Your profile interests us. You have talents and skills that we can help you develop. You're offering me a job. I'm offering you a fresh start. One year's military training, four years operational in the field. The recruitment and training of people who uh, who would do things like you know, go to another country and do bad things to good people. I only know about this from, uh, you know, secondhand reports. The KGB had a very, very murderous history, particularly in the beginning. After Stalin died, they became a little more civilized, but they were still doing bad things. My recruitment was completely different. It was, <laughs> it was a very very soft approach and it took a long time, to, uh, about almost two years to finally uh, ask me if I, if I was willing and ready to join them. I was a um, third year student at, a student at university when somebody introduced themselves. His cover was at the time, he said, you know, I'm a representative from a local uh, business and he wanted to just know because he he told me we know that you're a good student what are your plan plans after you graduate from college in those days in east germany you were assigned after you uh, to a post once you graduated from college at that point when he said that i i thought he was uh, the stasi east german secret police to me it was a great honor because you know in those days the soviet union was uh, strength-wise, at, at least the way we perceived it, the equal to the United States and the KGB probably was the most powerful secret service in the entire world. Uh, I would still think uh, it's highly unrealistic. Uh, I would I would give that a zero. Hey, Phil Jennings. How you doing, Stan Beeman? Uh, my wife, Elizabeth Page Henry. Hi. Hi. What do you do, Stan? I'm an FBI agent. <laughs> This scene is very realistic. There were 10 of us. We were supposed to live a life of ordinary Americans. 
Now, how the two kids fit into there, that, you know, especially already at that age, there were some agents that had children. Uh, I know a friend of mine who was an undercover agent for the KGB uh, at the same time I was there and he uh, was there with his wife, actually. They had a kid who was born in Brooklyn. My own experience was a little bit different in that the FBI, when they started investigating me, they <clears throat> managed to buy the house next door. Agents uh, occupied this house for a number of months to just watch me, but they never really did introduce themselves. Uh, they, this was just for purposes of observation, which <laughs> when I became a public persona, the producers of the Americans were like really giddy in that, you know, it was like, uh, it, it appeared that life was imitating art in that respect. Spies are people too. You do form relationships. That wasn't even a hint of something like that uh, ever being considered. Nothing. You get nothing from us. She's trained for this. So am I. We'll die before we'll talk. We know how to do that. The Americans are quite civilized. This is a quote I remember. Uh, one of the guys told me, uh, they will not torture you. The worst thing they might do to you is slap you on the face a couple of times. All right, so therefore this, this scene is, uh, is unrealistic from both ends. This is not how uh, US counterintelligence operates. And this is not how uh, a trained agent uh, would respond. That's over the top insane. The way these two agents supposedly operated, uh, running uh, a travel agency full time, being full time parents, and then doing all kinds of uh, uh, you know, being involved in all kinds of operations that require a lot of work, a lot of preparation, that re require you to be in three different places at the same time. All of this is totally unrealistic. I told him every time I see one of those main characters running around with a wig, I wince. Because that's the last thing that you want to do. Because God forbid somebody spots you and says, wait a minute, I know this guy. He looks different. What? That, that's odd. The wigs, I mean, <laughs> there's... That's a total no-no, with one exception. The people that work uh, surveillance, uh, they t sometimes they change the way they, they, they dress, they change a jacket or they put a scarf on, but that's not ever recommended for somebody who is supposed to be a long-term operational undercover agent. I, on content, I would give the Americans a five. Training is useful. But there is no substitute for experience. I agree. We use live targets as well. <laughs> this was very entertaining. I mean, I laughed, uh, particularly at the sentence, we use live targets. This whole training setup, even from a fictional aspect, it doesn't make any sense. The KGB clearly had bad guys. But this, this, this fellow with a leather jacket, I never met some uh, a KGB officer with a leather jacket. If you met them today, the way they were then, you would think they were just normal, everyday people. That's the whole point of being a spy. You, you, you don't want to look like one. This guy looks like a commissar, based on the, the way they were dressed in, during the revolutionary times in Russia. The KGB was too compartmentalized. You know, I met nothing but gentlemen gentlemen who operated uh, on behalf of the Soviet Union for a cause, and we were all committed communists. But uh, if, we, if we had, if, if they had uh, tried to make a military unit out of the folks that I worked with, <laughs> we, we would have lost in, in, in the first battle. All of a sudden she has a, a weapon in her shoe. <laughs> There's a KGB museum in New York City and, and they have some real gadgets that were used by the KGB, they would be given to most likely only, only a very special people uh, who were executing a particular very special assignment, just like go out and kill somebody or poison somebody. But this was not standard uh, equipment. Any of these gadgets are evidence. If counterintelligence goes through your home and they find 
even one thing with a secret compartment. I was operating within the universe of what's normal. And you can find a whole lot of things that you can use for tools and toys uh, that, that you can buy in any store. It's a minus one. Rule number one, never take your eye off your opponent. Oh my God! Yeah, I like, I like the acting. Uh, it's interesting. My training in self-defense was significantly less aggressive. I learned a handful of moves. I did get some self-defense training, uh, not to attack uh, FBI or uh, you know counterintelligence, but to uh, defend myself in case I wind up uh, at one point in a in a in a dangerous neighborhood with some uh, stuff on me, like money or uh, compromising materials. That's all the weapons training I got. This is killer training here, what we're looking at. KGB contingent was called Spesnaz, the special forces, like the Marines. They were trained for these special type of operations. We, we jumping ahead of ourselves to think that anything that's out in the media, in, uh, in movies, and podcasts and whatever uh, will get really close to the absolute truth. I'll even give it a five. It's well filmed. It's uh, these are first-rate actors. The name of the Russian agent is Salt, Evelyn Salt. My name is Evelyn Salt. Then you are a Russian spy. Truthful. So far, the fMRI scan registers truthful on everything he said. <laughs> this is pure fiction on a number of levels. First of all, sleepers were completely isolated. Uh, in other words, I couldn't betray anybody, even if I wanted to. The Russians did, did this very well, uh, what we call this compartmentalization. There is no such thing as a brain scan that will help you discover the truth. I was uh, still subjected to a lie detector test, which is the FBI still likes a lot, but it's it can be defeated. You have to really, really believe in the lie and be a congenital liar. Double agents existed, and uh, there was uh, were a couple of cases where the KGB had a mole within the FB FBI and within the CIA who did a lot of damage. If I may, I give it a double zero. Are you working for the Americans? I love my country. This is uh, taking KGB practices of the 30s, 40s into the early 50s and moving them forward into sort of uh, the contemporary scene and that's invalid. The KGB was, was absolutely brutal in interrogating people, shooting them in the back of the head and using all kinds of brutality which unimaginable. It's very similar to uh, what the Nazis did. This is one of the torture methods. You put a board or something to prevent real injuries, bruises and stuff like that, but to the head. Last time. Did you give a boucher to the Americans? Means are much more subtle and much more psychological than, than this kind of stuff. You, you threaten somebody with a gun. If they get out of it, they will hate you forever. There's a number of ways to make somebody switch. Uh, a threat to, to your family, that's a very, very strong incentive. When you have somebody who is like I, I lived in the United States for, for 10 years and I had uh, gotten used to some, a significant improved lifestyle. I had become an American in many respects. No, I, I think sex espionage, that's reality. I'd be surprised if, if there are any major intelligence services that aren't in some way recruiting women to do dirty work. Uh, I would not recommend this. Then the message comes through. We read you. This thing starts typing. 
and the, and the fellow happens to be in the place where it starts typing. Well, how do we know that he's there? There is no real way for somebody who is truly in isolation to give somebody an urgent message. The fastest way for me to receive and have received an urgent message in those days was through signals. And that would be with a possible delay of about a day or at least a half a day, let's say in the evening, the agent sets the signal in the morning, I read it. Is it possible to intercept a teletype message? I don't know, because I think in those days, you know, through uh, radio transmissions would, would have been preferable and they wouldn't just come on spontaneously. I mean, if you want to hand over documentation about, uh, say, a weapon system, you know, what do you, how do you do this? The easiest way is to, if you can, you steal it and put it on a electronic media. And, but if it's just a real short message, such as get out of here, a phone call, but you have to be now aware that phone calls are traced. There's also communication that uh, messages are compressed and, and transmitted in, in bursts and in short bursts, and then they get decompressed at the other end. But again, that has to be scheduled number stations. When, if you go in, into a short in a radio receiver and you, you go uh, and scan short waves, you will occasionally hear something when somebody says five, eight, six, nine. That's the secret message for somebody to be decoded. I looked for her everywhere. I couldn't find her at the airport. I even looked through all the flight lists. I headed down to the harbor. In this business, if you have an asset, and we're talking about an asset, it's a human being who is working with you. You want to do everything to protect them. You know, we're talking, uh, you know, an agent who 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 is trying to protect uh, a, a Russian who is working with him. I think that's entirely realistic. Hey, Jim, me and Eileen have uh, been figuring you could use a little entertainment. Yes, yeah, all right. Thank you. That would be lovely. Well, the... Uh, Purported agent is way too good looking. <laughs> we think that uh, Brosnan is, is actually a Russian. He has no accent. There is no such thing as a Russian born in Russia, raised in Russia, uh, can speak English with, uh, without an accent. God damn! Pretty good, Jimmy. Yeah, too damn good. You be yourself. You know, if you're good at something, you know, you show off. You, you play along. That was the whole idea. You, you, you want to befriend a lot of people, and you just want to blend in the best you can. You don't want to stand out too much. You know, I made a big mistake. I, I went back to college in the U.S. and I aced the entire program. But you know, showing off bowling skills, why not? You know. If you're a good golfer, somebody may want to play golf with you, and, and that's how you get to know people that might be of interest. This was very entertaining. I mean, I laughed, uh, particularly at the sentence we use live targets. 